I was meant to be presenting this, um, or presenting this project with Simone Kelly, who was unfortunately can't make it, and also Dr. Justine Harris. And what the importance of doing that was really just to demonstrate how clinician-led improvement strategy actually adds value and actually polarises an organisation to think differently. And I just wanted to start off with a story. And just before I do, we've been thinking over the last few days, stop really says stop doing something. But what we wanted to do was make it more meaningful. And I'm going to steal Elizabeth's cough tagline of um, moving from volume to value as part of this and actually maintaining stop as the overall project name. So. Just wanted to start, as we started to look through um, what was happening in our facilities, we came across a story from a, a senior resident who, was tell who told us about a patient who had metastatic breast cancer um, and was noted to have thrombocytopenia. The uh, iron studies were um, ordered for completeness and it was noted that the patient's ferritin was markedly elevated. Having been unsure about the relevance of this, the, the patient went on to have a whole series of tests and um, one of those was, was a painful bone, mar bone marrow biopsy, um, which didn't actually change the treatment plan and unfortunately the patient died of, from her disease three days after the procedure. But actually understanding this and what we actually do to people actually really does make you stop and think about making sure what we're doing is meaningful. Um, but in 2014, we actually um, started a looking at um, sensible test ordering. I guess the catalyst came from the change to the way we were billed and an opportunity to get our doctors to think differently. They had no disincentive to do something if basically um, the people who charge us money would continue to do so. Um, what we knew was the volume and, um, of pathology was unmeasured and unquestioned for some time, that there was harm associated with unnecessarily pathology testing and that there was waste. What we didn't know was um, how big the problem was, how to define inappropriate ordering and how we could minimise waste while enhancing clinically relevant tests were not affected. And really we took the approach on making sure the emphasis was on using clinical, clinical judgments to make decisions about what you do. Um, we also um, did some research and obviously looked at the, the Im impacts of um, unnecessary pathology ordering, increased risk of harm, increased workload, it, um, decreased test turnaround times, increased healthcare costs. And just to put it in context, we actually looked at um, our pathology expenditure across our local health district and it represented 14.7% of our total goods and services budget. And that's about 2.3% of our total budget. So a huge amount of money. Um, we also found that we had some increased diagnostic blood loss in an ICU. Our atrogenic anemia is quite common. And also that the risk, there was a risk of pursuing irrelevant tests um, which delayed management or discharge or both. And if we think about the hours of delay across our system, actually sensible test ordering isn't just about reducing tests, it's actually freeing up resources in, in terms of hours and manpower. Um, we appointed the, um, at Sutherland, we appointed the um, sensible test ordering um, project officer, who was Simone. Um, we developed um, a um, plan that linked to the roadmap for excellence that was in across the district. We looked at the data and identified that 10 tests accounted for 80% of the volume, and that was obviously low-hanging fruit. We also identified early adopters and high-volume high users, including um, the intensivists, um, and in emergency services at Sutherland. And we also identified the clinicians who wanted to um, change their practice. And as a result, we created a flexible, multi-interventional strategy that was driven by the local stakeholders. So in terms of what that meant um, to a subspecialty level, once we could provide meaningful data, what we were actually able to do was show the, the, the senior clinical staff their information. We allowed them, we, we showed them what could be inappropriate, what tests were ordered too frequently, and indeed some tests that were ordered not frequently enough. We did some caucusing with our junior medical staff, residents and um, registrars and nursing staff, and really under identified a culture of doing tests just in case, and urine microscopy is a big one of those. Um, I think across two facilities in the district, we identified that was $684,000 was spent on urine microscopies in one year, 69% of those, those samples were contaminated, so literally waste. 
Um, and when we can actually show the clinicians that information, it actually was very convincing in terms of we actually need to do things very differently. Just taking the urine thing um, just one step further, we set about a whole process of re-educating staff about if you're going to take a sample, how to do it properly. So it wasn't just a case of don't do it, do it but do it properly and make it meaningful. Um, we also um, found that not necessary, it wasn't necessary to, indicate, um, to order a full set of tests, just because what they thought the, boss, the bosses actually wanted. Um, how did we make the change? We looked at each subspecialty and developed the strategy in relation to those. And I'll give you an example with orthopaedics or planned orthopaedics. They had a view of a certain set of tests and we showed them that what was ordering differently and they put their own, they're now their own governors in terms of what goes on. We had a top-down, bottom-up approach. Again, senior uh, clinical leadership, Justine Harris, was very pivotal to that at Sutherland in actually sitting down with Simone and the senior medical staff to actually go through, show them the problem and then develop the solutions together. Um, we had governance at a, a, an LHD level and in fact what we've actually done now is made as part of our service rationalisation program that's clinically supported, it has clinical governance over the top. Um, we also made some changes to EMR and actually looked at individual practices and how people used EMR. Previously when we used paper we had a good governance structure and now what we know is we've got access to a huge catalogue of tests that we can't necessarily control. And from an emergency department perspective we actually looked at using the traffic light system and use the information that came from the College of Emergency, uh, sorry, the ECI and making sure what we were doing was actually lining up with the, with the key body. Um, what we d also did in our ICU was come up with a list of um, the order sets. Um, what we were finding when we actually looked down at the data is a whole battery test, were, the same tests were being ordered three or four times a day. The consultants thought they were being specific enough and they actually realised they weren't. Um, so now that actually has done that and what we've done is seen a 600, about a $600 reduction per episode in ICU at Sutherland. Um, the the, as a result of some of those targeted um, strategies we've done, interestingly one of the biggest um, reductions we've had is in LFTs and it's surprising how many of those tests are done every day. Certainly a huge reduction in costs associated with coagulation profile and actually looking in at that, what we call swap in, swap out. So rather than ordering a coagulation profile, we allowed, we made sure that INR was available. We had single test orders that are now replaced the top 50 and interestingly the top 50 were there because they were the highest frequency tests ordered so therefore they were easily available for the doctors just to tick and order that next test. Um, what that's actually done, and ex ex ignore the blip at the end, um, that was just some billing information, but what we've actually had is a significant reduction in the monthly pathology charges at Sutherland, it's around about $85,000 a month. Um, in the first, I guess the first six months while we were getting our information, we saved 250,000. Um, over a finan whole financial year, last year was 741 and this year we're still maintaining those gains. 6% reduction in overall specimen collection, defined ordering sets in um, ICU and also ED. The clinical streams are now looking at individual clinical order sets and the development of strategy um, the engagement of junior staff to minimise harm, um, the development of a strategy that we could use across all of our facilities and in fact are very applicable to any hospital in the state, in, in fact Australia. And what we've now done, like I've said before, is we've expanded the, the initiative across the LHD. Um, that's just some, I guess, a very graphical um, representation of the success of the project at Sutherland. Um, and one of the most important things that we wanted to do was make sure we were minimising harm. So what we've actually seen in our IMS, and we've looked at it as an overall 17% reduction in harm associated with the reduction in pathology. It's not just harm to our patients, it's harm to our staff in terms of needle stick injuries, you know, um, exposure to spilled urines and so on. Um, as part of our overall strategy, we're using Orbit um, or ClickView to provide a platform and I know this isn't anything new and um, Concord pretty much did the same two years ago. And Simone is a huge MasterChef fan. She's developed a recipe for success which includes, this is information that we make available to any site that actually wants it, to, that has the elements that we found have been successful. 
um, across the LH across Sutherland and indeed the LHG. And it's about making things meaningful, it's about making things relevant to our patients and just provide some overall guidance. Um, and now this is what's happened across our local health district. So we rolled out to Prince of Wales and St George um, at the beginning of the financial year and also now we're also looking at uh, the Royal and our other hospitals and year to date we've had a 6.6 .6 reduction in, the, uh, in, in pathology expense. And if you actually look at when I said we had a 17% reduction in harm and link that to the pathology that's what we, the potential we've got in terms of minimising harm to our patients. Is it scalable? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, in making sure that you've got the right governance and the right drive and the right support is really important to make sure what we do is no longer harm our patients. That's it. Thanks very much. Don't go away, Don. Don, come back. Don't go away because we're going to... Do do a Q&A with you and then we'll bring in the others. And uh, we'll bring up the Slido slide, so I know what people have been asking on Slido. And do, don't forget to put in a like and that will bring the more popular questions up to the top. Um, have, you, have you made an attempt to quantify the flow on cost reduction from that reduction in harm? Um, we're just about to, um, as part of, I guess, the next iteration. That was something that we actually saw as we were evaluating the project over the last 12, um, over the, I guess the last six months. Um, one of the things we want to try and do is, is quantify the time we save associated with reducing pathology in getting people out of hospital faster because we know it makes them, it's safer for patients to be at home. So it's work that we're about to do. And what about harm done by not doing the tests? Again, because we've taken the approach to make sure that you're using clinical judgment, we're not actually putting barriers in place to make sure that doctors aren't ordering tests that are specific. What we're actually getting to do is, is to use clinical judgment and thought about ordering that. So we haven't seen any of the adverse incidents that are associated with not doing tests. So was New, New South Wales pathology involved? They are, yeah. Yeah, we've actually got Rob Lindemann, who is um, the director of um, New South Wales pathology, is part of our governance group at the LHD level now. So what's happened to the uh, saved resources? Has sealed reduced staff? deployed them? Um, they have awareness that, that actually that they need to. Absolutely. The conversation we've had is that they're part of the problem and you know we spend more time doing tests so we can pay for infrastructure that we might not necessarily, necessarily need if we don't do the tests. So they're not necessarily the cash cow they thought they were? Um, I think you need to ask them that question. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure, I can't see the whole of the top question, um, but any tips for spreadability here? Yeah, I think so. One of the things that uh, particularly at, we did at St George, in, we, when we're saying we've got a bucket of money to look after our patients and we've got an opportunity to use those dollars differently. So to get the clinical engagement and to get, I guess, the confidence of the medical staff is we actually reinvested that money in resources that are front facing. They're actually looking after the patients. So they can so see the benefit. They can see on, the right? benefit, absolutely. So that's, that's, now that I can see that question because I stopped looking there. Um, so that's really about how to change the culture of waste, which is really what's in it for me. You what's see in it, and, and that's it. it. I mean, the healthcare dollar is there to be expended on providing safe patient care. If we were use the, the money that we save from reducing waste and put it in to making sure our junior medical staff numbers are strong, that we have enough nursing staff to look after our patients, then that's the benefit. That's the what's in it for me. Don, thank you very much and thank congratulations. That's well. great. So the next two presentations, that's why we had a Q&A with Don, because the next two are different, and they relate to radiation oncology. Um, the second one being on hyperfractionated radi radi radiotherapy, which some of you might have noticed is one of the uh, Cancer Australia put out a statement the other day, which is uh, the first of the tumour groups to actually have what is best practice, inappropriate and appropriate care, and hyperfractionated radiotherapy, which we'll come to in a moment with Carmen Hansen, was part of that, and you're going to hear a presentation. But the first presentation is on seed tracker targeting prostate cancer for high precision radiotherapy, and Sankar Arumugam is the uh, presenter, Sankar. And also, um, the, uh, you know, the interesting point here, of course, is that radiation therapy is underutilized in prostate cancer um, at enormous cost. Oh, it's Mark. Yes, that's right. So, not Sankar, I'm sorry, that's Mark. Okay. No, that's all right. 
Um, I'll start today. I'll be, uh, my name's Mark Sidham. I'll be talking about the problem, and then uh, Senkar will come and talk about uh, our solution. So, prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in men in Australia. And I'm sure you've all heard it said that men die with prostate cancer and not from prostate cancer. But based on data from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, this year approximately 3,400 men will die from prostate cancer. And to put that in perspective, that's slightly more than the number of women who will die from breast cancer, and it's significantly more the number of men who will die from bowel cancer. And so prostate cancer certainly poses a significant health burden for Australian men. There are two main treatment options for prostate cancer, localised disease being either radiotherapy or surgery. This slide is from a recent landmark randomised controlled trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine just two weeks ago. Um, and they presented 10 year data showing that radiotherapy and surgery in fact have identical cure rates and this is represented by the overlapping uh, red and blue lines in the graph. And while the cure rates were the same, men who had radiotherapy had significantly less side effects, especially rates of incontinence and erectile dysfunction. So radiotherapy is an important weapon in the fight against prostate cancer. Now, I'll take you through a very brief history of the development of radiotherapy over the last 25 years, and I'll do this because only by going through that process can you really appreciate the breakthrough that we've achieved in this project. In the 1980s, um, because the prostate couldn't be seen on x-rays, it meant that the prostate could only be treated through large fields, through the front and back, and through the sides. And so the highest radiation dose we could give with this very basic treatment technique was 66 gray. Gray is a measure of radiation dose. And this dose didn't cure very many men. By the 1990s, patients could have their prostate accurately marked up on a CT scan. And you can see here the prostate's in green, seminal vesicles in red, and the rectum, which is a structure we want to avoid, is in dark blue. And with this technology, a more sophisticated technique could be used that treated the prostate from six different directions, with each beam targeting the prostate from different angles. And this more advanced technique allowed us to get a hotter dose into the prostate up to around 74 gray. And in more recent years, much more advanced techniques have developed, such as delivering radiotherapy while the machine is rotating around the patient. And this allows us to create a really exquisite dose delivery right to where you want it. We also started implanting three tiny gold seeds in the prostate before radiotherapy. And this was done so that before radiotherapy each day, while you can't see the prostate, you can see the three gold seeds implanted in the prostate and therefore the position of the prostate could be determined and you could make sure you're hitting your target accurately every day. And the combination of these techniques brought us up to around 78 gray or 80 gray with all of this technology. But how high is high enough? Do we need to try to reach even higher doses of radiotherapy? There's been some really confronting data from a, a randomised trial called the Ascend RT trial. This trial compared 78 gray with that te technique I've just described to an ultra dose escalator technique. I won't go into the technicalities, but it's combined external beam radiotherapy and brachytherapy, but effectively giving about 100 gray. And they reported that the higher dose almost halved the failure rates or significantly improved the rates of cure. Now, their technique of getting to 100 gray is invasive and many men don't find that acceptable. So at Liverpool and MacArthur, what we wanted to do was emulate that data by a non-invasive technique called stereotactic radiotherapy. This is an approach that delivers very high doses of radiotherapy in just a few fractions or treatment sessions. But to do so, 
the margin of error has to be kept really small, down to just three millimetres. And I invite you all to hold up your finger, your forefinger and your thumb and just kind of imagine three millimetres. We have that margin around the prostate gland which is deep inside the pelvis. It takes about 15 minutes to deliver a stereotactic radiotherapy dose. Now when we first set up the patient, we find the gold seeds, we position them accurately. So we know that they're in the right position at the beginning of the 15 minutes. But what if the prostate moves during those 15 minutes of treatment? In fact, it's really well documented that the prostate moves a lot. It can move up to 10 to 20 mils because of bowel and bladder changes or muscular movements in the diaphragm just below the prostate. Now, if you've got a very tight margin around the prostate, this can be a serious problem. The yellow light here represents the radiotherapy beam, and if the prostate moves too much during radiotherapy, then it will move outside the beam. And of course, that means that you can miss the cancer, and there's a higher risk of damaging normal tissues. So this was a critical problem for our stereotactic radiotherapy program. We had to develop a way to watch the prostate during the radiotherapy delivery so that if the prostate moved, we could detect that movement, we could pause the beam, reposition the patient, and then recommence the radiotherapy treatment. Now, there are two commercially available solutions to this problem. They're very expensive. Um, they need significant hardware installation to your existing machines it would have cost us somewhere between 1.2 and $2 million to fit out just two machines, one at each site. And these approaches are quite complex and non-integrated. So we started this project to develop an in-house solution using our existing equipment, and we dubbed this solution Seed Tracker. And I'll just hand over to Sankar to explain further. Thanks, thanks very much, Mark. Thanks for giving the very nice overview of the problem. As Mark mentioned, there are commercial solutions, but it has its own limitations and problem. So we decided to develop our own solution that will overcome this limitation. So what are the ideal requirements of an ideal system? The first, first and essential requirement is it should allow us to we should, I mean, identify the prostate position during treatment delivery in real time and accurately. That is our first requirement. And again, it should give the clear instructions to the operator what to do during the treatment delivery and what to do when prostate moves outside the tolerance limits. And if we wish to reposition, what magnitude of uh, corrections we supposed to do. All these things have to happen on the fly when, we, when the patient is on the bed and we deliver the radiation beam. And also it should fit in very smoothly within our existing equipment and workflow. Uh, if possible, it should also be cost effective. So we try to come up with a system uh, that will fulfill all this feature. When we developed the system, we were very mindful in utilizing all the existing capabilities of the treatment machines available in our center. What you see here is our system has the ability to do the X-ray imaging when it do the uh, treatment delivery. So we try to exploit that feature in our machine. The movie on the right side is the live X-ray images acquired during the treatment. As you can appreciate, the gold seeds implanted in the prostate is visible on this image, even though some of the image, some of the images are noisy. So what we need is a mechanism and system to automatically determine the seat position and report the user where the prostate is and what to do if it is, if it moves outside the tolerance limits. So we try to develop this system to add an extra intelligence to our existing treatment machine. So that is the genesis of our system. We call it seat tracker. What you see here is the user interface of our system. The movie here is the live capture acquired during actual treatment delivery of one of our cancer patients. 
What I will do in next few slides, I will take you through some of the important components of our system, how it works. Seed tracker is completely integrated to our treatment machine. What it means is, once you select a patient in the seed tracker, it automatically establishes the communication with the treatment machine and it reads the images acquired during the treatment continuously in real time. The acquired images are displayed in this panel. It not only reads the image, in real time it identifies the I mean, gold seeds implanted in the prostate. The I automatic identification of gold seeds is not a trivial problem because it has been implemented very advanced algorithms to uh, identify these prostate, uh, these gold seeds with sufficient confidence during the treatment. What the system also does is it calculates the expected seed position in that imaging angle according to the original treatment plan and compares the detected position with the expected position. Using this information, it calculates the prostate position in real time and gives that as the plot. What you see here in the blue and the red line is the prostate position difference compared to the planned position during the treatment delivery. The, yellow, the, sorry, the green lines represents the allowed tolerance limit. What we want to see is the both green, sorry, both red and blue lines are always within this green line. So, so what we, what we, so what we will do if it goes outside the tolerance limits? System has to clearly instruct the treatment operator what to do. In this particular instance, as the red line moves outside the tolerance limits, the system alerts the operator to stop the treatment. When we encounter the situations like this, we stop the beam and we have to correct for its offset. Our system also gives the exact magnitude and the direction in which you have to perform the corrections. It also gives the start and end position of the tables for the verification purpose. So after perform the correction, we can continue the treatment this is again the live capture after the correction in that particular case. As you can see, we resume the treatment when the prostate is well within the acceptable tolerance limit. So what are the process we went through to translate this uh, solution into the clinical, uh, clinical use to use it on our patients? So it, uh, this is um, fully homegrown software, so we did a very comprehensive accuracy test in order to validate, it, validate its performance. And it is, a very, it is a complete teamwork of experts from multidisciplinary specialty. And it, it, it involves radiation oncologists, medical physicists, radiation therapists, clinical trial coordinator, and some legal experts to get the required uh, approval. And also to use it in the clinic, we also obtained the necessary ethical and legal clearances. And now we are in the process of obtaining the IP protection on this system. Uh, to date, we have used this system on more than 20 treatments. In these, sorry, more than 60 treatments. And in the 60 treatments, we were able to identify 12 occurrences of prostate position outside the tolerance limits. And all these deviations were corrected in real time and dose was delivered accurately. If we didn't have monitored in real time and corrected for these deviations, the dose delivery will be less accurate, which will have the effect on the uh, treatment outcome and, uh, and the radiation related associated comorbidities. So what is our experience so far? Our system proven to be very accurate. It improves the treatment quality, safety, and efficiency. And it, it integrates seamlessly with our existing treatment unit and our workflow. And it also can be easily adapted to the other radiotherapy centers. The seed tracker system as such can be used for any other cancer sites where the gold seeds can be implanted. 
And now we, are also develop, we have also developed the systems that will perform the markerless tracking during the treatment that can be used in the lung, uh, intracranial tumors, and uh, spine tumors treatment. So to conclude, stereotactic radiotherapy needs prostate position monitoring during treatment. Our system seat tracker monitors prostate position successfully during the treatment, alerts the operator if prostate moves outside the tolerance limits. It enhances the accuracy of the dose delivery, which results in maximized cancer cure and minimized side effects. It also improves the efficiency of the overall treatment by reducing the treatment time. And it's, it's also cost effective because it doesn't require any additional expensive hardware systems inside the treatment unit. So I would like to acknowledge our three members for helping us in translating this into the clinical practice. And thanks for your attention. We'll get you back up for some discussion later. And to talk about hyperfractionated post-mastectomy radiation therapy, Dr. Carmen Hansen, who's a radiation oncologist at the Mid-North Coast Cancer Institute and the, um, the Mid-North Coast Local Health District. Uh, Joshua Mortimer as well. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak today and thank you especially to the audience members for staying for the very last talk of the first day. So I'm going to be talking about hypofractionated post mastectomy radiotherapy. Uh, that's something that we do at the Mid North Coast Cancer Institute. It's something that we've in implemented some years ago uh, and we're following up on our results. And in, the, um, in, the, uh, in keeping with the theme of this symposium, I'm going to refer to this model of innovation that was first described by Gabrielle Tard in 1903. Um, as a framework uh, to describe some of the evidence and background for the post-mastectomy radiotherapy. So it's very well established that post-mastectomy radiotherapy improves outcomes for patients with node-positive breast cancer. And I'm just going to stop there for a minute um, to acknowledge the patients who have, uh, who have done and continue to inspire us every day as oncologists to try to improve treatment techniques to help them through the course of treatment. So we know that post mastectomy radiotherapy improves outcomes for these patients. Uh, the post mastectomy radiotherapy involves treating the chest wall, the tissues of the chest wall uh, and the surrounding lymph node areas. So that will be the uh, lymph glands under the arm in the axilla and at the base of the neck in the supraclavicular fossa. This is a front on view of a radiotherapy plan for someone having treatment to the left side. We know um, from very well conducted very well conducted randomised controlled trials of post mastectomy radiotherapy and also of a large meta-analysis of over 8,000 patients that post mastectomy radiotherapy reduces the risk of breast cancer recurrence and of dying from breast cancer. Another thing that we know and that has been touched on by Norman is that hypofractionated radiotherapy is now the preferred regimen for uh, breast radiotherapy. Um, this has come out in the uh, Cancer Australia document uh, very recently. And so now I have to do a little bit of radiotherapy, radiation oncology terminology. Um, so conventionally fractionated post mastectomy radiotherapy. Uh, this is what has been done traditionally. It's giving uh, treatment once a day, Monday to Friday, for five weeks. So that's a total of 25 treatments. Hypofractionated post mastectomy radiotherapy uh, is giving treatment once a day, Monday to Friday, for 15 treatments. So that's over a total of three weeks. I find it really hard to say conventionally fractionated post mastectomy radiotherapy and hypofractionated post mastectomy radiotherapy. So, um, and in, in the interest of time, we're going to call the five week course the long course and the three week course short course. It'll be the long and the short of it. Sensible, that's right. 
So we do know that short course is safe and effective uh, for the treatment of early breast cancer. And we know that for, from some um, uh, landmark trials. This one that was published in the New England Journal um, in about 2005, conducted out of Canada, um, and they, can, they compared long course and short course radiotherapy in women with early stage breast cancer. Now these women had not had a mastectomy, they had a lumpectomy, but you can see that even out to 12 years, you can barely separate those curves. There was no difference in local recurrence or in survival. Similarly, uh, a team in the UK conducted uh, another very large randomised trial comparing long course and short course radiotherapy, again in the, in the setting of the intact breast, so after lumpectomy, and again, you can barely separate those curves. There was no difference in the outcomes for patients treated with long course and short course. They went on to, to look very carefully at the side effects and toxicity of treatment. And again, uh, there was no increase in long-term side effects uh, by using short-course radiotherapy. And importantly, there was a slight improvement in the short-term side effects in the skin and the breast tissue when they used the short-course radiotherapy. And so we started to form an opinion. We looked at those randomised trials that had been done in the setting of the intact breast. We noted that a proportion of the patients in the UK trial actually had post-mastectomy radiotherapy, about 10% of them, and they did every bit as well as the patients who had long course. We did some radiobiological calculations, and I was kind of hoping that Mark would cover that for me, but he didn't. I'm not going to go into it, and you'll thank me for that. Um, but essentially, we know that giving short course is actually a little bit cooler to some of the very sensitive structures, such as nerves, than it is to give long course radiotherapy. We also know that short course is now being included in major randomised studies that are being um, conducted internationally and uh, we are recruiting in Australia as well. So these are two uh, current trials, Posnok and Supremo, being con conducted in post-mastectomy radiotherapy. They're recruiting really well and short course is a treatment option. And finally, international experience. Our colleagues in Canada and the UK do short course post-mastectomy radiotherapy all the time. And so this is our beautiful campus um, at uh, the Port Macquarie Base Hospital. We made a decision to adopt short course radiotherapy. We've implemented it with care. We've developed a very tight um, evidence-based uh, treatment protocol to ensure uniformity of treatment. We conduct very complex planning treatment. Uh, we use state-of-the-art treatment techniques. We have peer review and and, and this is an example of some of uh, a patient's plan uh, for post-mastectomy radiotherapy. Um, a lot of work goes into those plans. We collect prospectively. So we've developed a, a quite a sophistic sophisticated database for prospective collection of patient outcome data uh, and toxicity data. So every time we see a patient for follow-up, we collect data um, for uh, using validated tools that we can um, compare with uh, other published series. And then to, for confirmation of the decision that we've made the right decision, uh, we run four automated reports fortnightly to assess the rates of toxicity, both uh, looking at indivi individual patients, but also at an institutional level, the rates of different toxicity items for, uh, for the patients. And we've got those benchmarked. Uh, uh, we compare those with uh, published data. We have monthly morbidity and mortality meetings to review the outcomes of patients. And I'd now like to hand over to Josh, who's undertaken a formal retrospective review of our outcomes. <coughs> Thank you, Carmen. And thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to come along and share our work. Now, everyone's looking a little bit tired at the end of day one, so I'm going to sacrifice 30 seconds of my presentation time to get everybody to stand up. Stand up. Everyone in the back. Yep. March three times on the spot. Do some stretches if you want. OK. Now sit down and listen. We're almost there. It's not an excuse to run out the back. So yeah, my name's Josh. I'm a final year medical student. I'm based up in Coffs Harbour. And during my honours year, I worked with the Mid-North Coast Cancer Institute uh, to conduct a formal retrospective review of their post-mastectomy hypofractionated patients. 
Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about now. <clears throat> So as Dr. Hansen said, the Mid-North Coast Cancer Institute has been using hypofractionated radiotherapy in a proportion of its post-mastectomy breast cancer patients since as early as 2008. The purpose, or the primary purpose of this review was to evaluate economic outcomes from this. So we um, understood that the reduced treatment time involved in hyperfractionated radiotherapy would likely translate to uh, economic savings. But we wanted to quantify exactly what this looked like, how much this was, and what the bro broader implications could be for the health system at large. Secondarily, we wanted to look at patient outcomes. So we wanted to know how these patients were doing. We wanted, we wanted to know about short and long-term toxicity, disability, morbidity, mortality. And we also wanted to look at how they, thought, how they felt about the decision to undertake what is a relatively novel uh, treatment regime within Australia. The study contained two arms. So the first um, involved looking at 216 uh, post-mastectomy breast cancer patients treated with either short or long course uh, therapy. Um, we looked at Medicare billing data to evaluate economic outcomes. We looked at referral rates for treatment for lymphedema and wound care. Uh, to assess if there are any differences in the requirement for this treatment uh, between the short and long course regimes. And we looked at disease outcomes. So we looked at tumour recurrence, both locally in the breast and distant, and we looked at mortality amongst these patients. The second arm of the study involved a mail-out survey, and this contained a number of validated tools to assess a number of things. Firstly, lymphedema, um, the severity and incidence of lymphedema in the upper limbs, which is a common side effect of breast radiotherapy, as well as disability of the arm, shoulder and hand, which can result from damage to nerves, for example, the brachial plexus, uh, fibrosis of underlying tissues, or just simply from overlying lymphedema. And it also included a validated tool to look at decision regret. Now, importantly, the short and long course cohorts in our study um, were comparatively similar. Um, there were no significant differences between the two groups with regards to tumour characteristics, although the short course patients did tend to be slightly older than the long course patients. The majority of patients in both groups were, had metastases to at least one lymph node region, and the majority of tumours were of a medium to high grade. Let's look first at the economic evaluation. So this was assessed using a combination of decision tree, t-test, and logistic regression modeling. And we found that on average, the short course regime saved in the order of $2,659 per patient. To put this in perspective, we used data from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare to determine that at a national level, if the short course regime were to be adopted as standard practice for post-mastectomy breast cancer patients, there would be a potential saving of over $9 million to Medicare, or $80,000 at the North Coast Cancer Institute alone. But that's only savings to Medicare. What about the patient factor? So in our cohort, we're talking about um, a regional centre in Australia where one in three of our patients resided more than 100 kilometres from their treating centre. With, and we're talking about a treatment regime which has the potential to cut the duration of treatment almost in half. So that's less time spent travelling, that's less time spent uh, spending money on accommodation, that's less time spent away from work, and that's less time spent away from their support networks at home. As I mentioned, we looked at wound referral rates for wound care and the requirement for such amongst the two cohorts. What we found was that the short course regime actually appeared comparatively uh, less damaging to superficial tissues, manifested by a significant reduction in the need for wound care referrals. While one in two of patients in the long course regime required wound care, this was the case for only one in 10 of the short course regime. Similarly, we looked, for the, looked at the need for lymphedema care, and we found that there was no significant difference between the two groups with respect to this outcome. We looked at mortality and recurrence data and used Kaplan-Meier and Cox proportional hazards analyses to discover that there was in fact no significant difference in these outcomes over the duration of our follow-up. As I mentioned, the second arm of the study involved validated survey tools to assess upper limb function and lymphedema. And again, we found no significant difference in either the incidence or severity of either of these outcomes between the short and long course regimes. So what did we find overall? So we found that the hyperfractionated or short course regime saved in the order of $2,381 per patient. Now that's from the decision tree analysis, which is weighted for differing rates of uh, treatment to the lymph node regions. 
We found that hyper, the short course regime had a reduced requirement for wound care in the six months following treatment. And this is something which Carmen sees every day in her practice as well, clinically. We found that our recurrence and mortality results were promising, and further longer term follow-up of these results will be important in confirming this. We found that at a median follow-up of three years, upper limb um, scores for upper limb function and lymphedema were equivalent between the two regimes. And we further found that those patients who had undergone the hypofractionated regime expressed no increased level of regret at having undertaken a relatively novel uh, treatment regime in Australia with compared to the short course regime. Now, obviously we acknowledge that there are some limitations to this study, particularly that it's a retrospective study, but we believe that these, prom these results are promising and that they will have an impact on practices within Australia. The economic data has already been subject of a um, publication in the Journal of Medical Imaging and Radiation Oncology earlier this year, and the clinical data is currently undergoing review for publication. Um, and I'll hand back over to Dr. Hansen to finish off. Thanks, Josh. So the early bird catches a worm, and I think he said yes to supersize, actually. Um, but the early bird gets eaten. So we haven't been the early bird, nor have we been the early worm. We've been the second or third worm. Um, we've drawn on the experience of our colleagues in um, the UK and Canada and, and introduced hypofractionated postmastectomy radiotherapy at the mid-north coast. Um, I can say I love that I can offer this to my patients when they hear that there's an option of three works, weeks versus five weeks. Um, very few of them uh, opt uh, to have the long course treatment now. We've done it in, uh, we've introduced uh, this regimen in such a way that we've had strict treatment protocols, patients are treated uh, uniformly, we follow them up very closely, uh, we collect all of our uh, follow-up and toxicity data prospectively, and as you can see, we monitor, monitor real-time at a departmental level, and uh, in doing projects like this, we then can report our outcomes, hopefully, so that uh, our results can translate into a change in clinical practice nationally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Mark, Sankar, come on up. Um, so, all good. Perhaps not so relevant, but maybe relevant in Port Macquarie, but other places where you, you have private equity buying up big private um, radi you know, radiology practices. They're paid by the fraction which is probably why Cancer Australia felt the need, on, at least with lumpectomy and early breast cancer, to say it's appropriate care to have hypofractionated radiotherapy because you make money out of it in the private sector. So the relevance here while we're talking about the public sector is if patients know in the private sector they're getting more fractions, they might be falsely convinced by marketing that that's better for them and that influences the public sector. Yes. Um, so. Look, so one thing I, I always do when I have this discussion with patients about long course and short course, and I don't oft offer short course to, to every patient. There are a few patients for whom I think it's not suitable. Um, but when I do, I discuss the, the level of evidence that we have um, and uh, you know compare that with the evidence we have for long course with regards to feeling like they, they might be shortchanged. We have, a, as, as you know, the first bit of advice patients get is usually what they remember the most. So a lot of them come in and say, but my surgeon said, I'm gonna have six weeks of radiotherapy, so why are you suggesting three? It's just a matter of just engaging with that patient and having the conversation. Ultimately, if a patient says to me, I want to have long course, then I'm very happy to give them long course so, treatment. So my question is a bit more insidious than that. I know, I'm trying to avoid it. Avoid it, it. yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's huge money in private radiotherapy and it's all about increasing the number of fractions they give patients. So in the UK and Canada, I understand that they're, so UK and Canada, I understand that they're paid per patient rather than per fraction. And, and I, I suspect that with the introduction of, you know, more and more, Mark, we're seeing more and more hypofractionated stereotactic radiotherapy, I suspect that there will be a push to change the per fraction um, uh, payments because, uh, you know, we know that we're headed towards more short course treatment. So the interesting thing to speculate, we might talk about it on the couch tomorrow, is whether when you go to public-private partnerships with private groups, whether or not, um, you know, the incentives are right in the system to actually 
that if you move towards this more innovative care that requires less treatment, whether these groups will be properly incentivised by the contracts. What are we going to do about the urologists here, Mark? What are we going to, yeah, that, well, that's an easy question. That should only take uh, <laughs> 10 seconds to answer. Look, I, I don't think radiation oncology is obviously not um, isolated in this problem. A any surgeon, of course, has the same... I think you have to say it, it's a conflict of interest. It's a conflict of interest when it's, a, a, you know, your decision to treat or to not treat or how you treat will have an impact on your billing. But a couple of things to say, uh, as you know, as doctors, as everybody, you need to be able to sleep well at night, you need to be able to rest comfortably that you offered your patients quality care. Um, and I, I think the second thing to say is that from purely a, you know, corporate business perspective, the best um, way to run a practice is to run best quality medicine and I think that that will in fact turn into so, a, so thriving, a thriving um, practice. But that requires consumers in the New South Wales health system to understand there are serious options here. Surgery I, th I is not think the only so and, and what I say to everybody you know when I have discussions with urologists I say I really don't care what patients choose, there's only one thing I care is that they know their treatment options. And if they know their treatment options, they'll make the right decision for themselves. And outcomes. There's been lots of fancy new things happening in radiotherapy. Um, they look great, but they don't necessarily change outcomes. E excellent question. So what about so your fancy gizmo? Yeah, so we, um, we are doing, we en enrol every single patient onto a phase two prospective clinical trial, we collect data, we report that data, we presented our first um, outcomes um, data just at the college meeting uh, last week. Can you please thank our panel, two fantastic examples of science-based innovation. Well done. Thank you very much indeed.